We're so glad that you're joining with us in worship today, wherever you are and whatever time it is. It's just great to be able to come together and worship. This is the day that the Lord has made. We rejoice and are glad in this day, and we're glad that you're here with us. And I'm going to be so glad when I can say that to a church filled with a community of faith. But it's such a blessing to be able to do these online services and appreciate everybody who's helped make this happen and appreciate all the input that we have from folks. So glad that you're joining with us. This is Mount Pisgah Lutheran Church, but our focus is not on Mount Pisgah. It's always on Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior and our very best friend. So we welcome you. Also, just an announcement to make that Mother's Day is a week from today, and we will have our online services as always, but we also invite you to join with us at 10 o'clock in our parking lot. Bring the family, bring some bread or crackers uh, and some grape juice, and we're going to celebrate communion within our cars in a parking lot service on Mother's Day. It's going to be unique and very special service, probably about 45 minutes. We'll sing some songs together, and I'm looking forward to all of us when I say honk if you love your moms. For everybody to do that, it's going to be fun. Be memorable, and moms deserve that. So join with us uh, next Sunday, a week from today, 10 o'clock. Bring the cars. If you can't get here a little bit early, as it's going to take a little time to get everybody situated, we will be safe. Uh, we promise that on every level, but we'll certainly make a memorable service together. You know, one of the things that has been said over and over again is that in these circumstances, in these diff- difficult and different times, that everything that we hear sounds a little different, whether it's a prayer or whether it's a scripture or a devotion. I read this devotion today, and just in the reading of it, it just seems so perfect. So it's going to be our opening prayer to share with you from Christ in our home. It's called Genuine Peace. Before Jesus' death, he gathered for a Passover meal with his disciples. He washed their feet and encouraged them to stand firm despite coming troubles. He promised to send the Holy Spirit to guide them, and he offered them peace unlike anything the world gives. During the season of Easter, we are encouraged by Jesus' resurrection. We know that because Jesus is risen, we can be too. We trust in that resurrection, and sometimes we doubt. And the peace Jesus promised is not the fake peace of avoidance or the inauthentic peace of a pasted-on smile. This peace is deep and wide, echoing powerfully from Jesus' words to the disciples down to us through the ages. Genuine peace. Jesus does not leave us alone in our fear or abandon us in our doubt. When we face challenges or hopelessness or grief, Jesus brings comfort. Peace be with you, he says. In seasons of uncertainty in our lives, these words can reassure us and renew our confidence and our faith. And I hope in the hearing of these, they did that. Amen. Hey, Sam, it's good to see you again. You're getting to be a regular around here. It looks like you haven't been able to be the barber lately either. No, I sure haven't. I wonder who that is at the door. You mind getting it? Well, sure. I may have a hard time reaching the doorknob, but I will try. Well, Sam, who was it? A delivery man from Amazon. He had one of those masks on. It's hard to even tell if people are smiling these days. Yes, it is. Well, I trust that you smiled at him when you opened the door. I sure did. This smile is pretty much my permanent look. (laughs) It's important to open the door with a welcome and a smile always, you know. You know, Sam, Jesus said once that he was like a door, an open welcome door to each one of us. That means so much because, you know, in this world, there are just a lot of closed doors, it seems like. You mean like when my friend wouldn't talk to me because he was upset with me? Exactly. Or like when I didn't make the baseball team, it kind of felt like a closed door. Yes, you know, and Jesus always has an open door to us, Sam. He called himself the Good Shepherd. 
And like a good shepherd, he said he knows each and every one of us by name. That's great. I had a teacher and a coach that knew all of our names. It makes you feel so special. Well, you know, Sam, there's a neat scripture in Revelation 3.20. Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and will have a meal with him. Wow, that is neat. Who wouldn't want to open the door of their heart to Jesus? Yes, he knows each and every one of us by name, and he wants to be in our hearts for us to open that door to him as he's opened it up to us. That is really good news. Thanks so much. Well, Sam, don't thank me. Let's thank Jesus. In fact, let's do that right now. How about if we pray? Let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you for loving us so much that you know each of us by name. You are our good shepherd. Thanks for always having the door of your heart open to us. Help us to always do the same to you each day. And Lord, we thank you for having us in your hands and all the world in your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. He's got the whole world in his hands. 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 He's got the itty bitty babies in his hands. He's got the itty bitty babies in his hands. He's got the itty bitty babies in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got you and me, brother, in his hands. He's got you and me, brother, in his hands. He's got you and me, brother, in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got me and you, sister, in his hands. He's got you and me, sister, in his hands. He's got you and me, sister, in his hands. He's got the whole world 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 in his hands. It is a credit to you if, being aware of God, you endure pain while suffering unjustly. If you endure when you are beaten for doing wrong, what credit is that? But if you endure when you do right and suffer for it, you have God's approval. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When he was abused, he did not return abuse. When he suffered, he did not threaten but he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that free from sins we might live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were going astray like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. Hi, everybody. The Gospel according to John. So again Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Jesus said, I came that you may have life and have it abundantly. Not just getting by, flourishing, not just eking out an existence, 
thriving, not just prolonging the days on earth, but living life here to the fullest, abundant life. Isn't that really what we all want? What we want for ourselves and especially the people we love and the people around the world? It seems, I think, a little self-explanatory. But something happened this week that made me change my mind about that. And today this phrase, abundant life, raises a couple of questions for me. And as a spoiler alert, I don't think I've really nailed down the answer to either one. The first question, what does abundant life really mean? I wonder if abundant life may be one of those phrases that we use as Christians, which means a lot more to us and might be problematic for others. Let me explain. As most of you know, my daughter Chris came down a few weeks ago from Chicago to help out while my leg heals. She is, like your children, very intelligent, very well read, and possesses excellent critical thinking skills. So she seemed a logical person to bounce some ideas off for this sermon. So imagine how taken aback I was when after I made my points, she replied, I don't think I'm the right person, Mom. I don't know what you mean by abundant life. Really? How could anyone not know what an abundant life is? You know, abundant, full, overflowing, bountiful. Life, well, life. How couldn't she know what an abundant life is? It may help you to know that Chris is, isn't a Christian, but I thought to myself, what do I mean? What do I mean by an abundant life if I'm trying to explain it to her? Is it the amount of happiness I have? Is it the number of friends? Is it the quantity of good deeds I do for others? The amount to which I feel at peace? My bank account? How often I feel my prayers are answered? The happiness I see in my family? Or is it just maybe a general sense of well-being and calm? Maybe, maybe that's part of it. But if those are the metrics by which I measure abundant life, then it's pretty flawed. And it sure isn't fair. Because that would mean that Jesus hands out blessings of the same type and to the same degree for all his people. And that sure isn't the case. And of course those metrics are flawed. Because the question is flawed. It isn't about what I mean by abundant life. It's about what Jesus means. The moment we start gauging our abundance on what we have or what we do, we've missed the point entirely. The answer to what an abundant life is has far less to do with our circumstances than the fact that God is with us in all our circumstances. And I find that especially helpful these days. These days as we are bombarded with images of scarcity, not enough medical supplies, not enough food, not enough employment, somehow Jesus reminds us he offers abundance. I don't understand it. If you haven't been knocked off center at least a little bit over the last couple months, I am impressed. But if you have been, like I have been, maybe you'll find helpful what I have found helpful. Let's get back to the basics. Let's not try to solve all the mysteries of faith in the universe today. Let's get out of our heads for a moment and rest down in our hearts and in our spirit. And remember what our experience in faith has taught us. God cares for you. 
God is your abundance. The only metric for abundance was determined from the beginning of time and is found in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And this brings me to my second question. Well, maybe it's not really a question. Maybe it's more of a conclusion. If I can admit truly that an abundant life is about what God has done and is not up to me to keep an eye on my storehouses or to keep checking off boxes on a checklist that's only important to me, then maybe the abundance Jesus offers and I can enjoy today is an abundance of rest, a time for comfort. In times like this when our existential rug is snatched <clears throat> from underneath our feet, let's take a deep breath and amble through green pastures and drink from those pools of still water. And will Chris or many others like her ever believe that? I have no idea. I am certain though that God wants an abundant life for her and the others as well. And that may look very different than it does for, from mine. But I'm choosing to trust God with that and with her. And I think that that actually is the beginning of any abundant life that is worth living. Not one based on what we think or what we desire, but trusting God to provide and show us each uniquely and individually what true abundance is. I'm not going to think about social distancing today. Today I'm going to focus on feeling closer to God. Today I'm going to take a break from the news. I'm going to listen to that opera of birdsong one more time. I'm going to take a walk. I'm going to write a love letter. I might take a nap or call a friend or make some art or sing or I might just lay flat on my back and watch the clouds overhead. And all the questions which tug at our hearts or at the tip of our tongue behind our masks for now can wait. And in this moment, may we truly know that all we need is found abundantly in and through Christ. Amen.
Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespassing as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We are so blessed to have had you with us in worship today. And I hope it was truly a blessing for you. Be sure to join with us next week as we celebrate moms together uh, on Mother's Day. Also, our 10 o'clock outside service in the parking lot. Certainly join with us for that uh, as well. You know, the scriptures say that without a vision, the people perish. You know, one of the most difficult things, I think, for what we're going through right now is the whole idea of planning, of having some vision as to what's going to be out in the future. It's really difficult not to be able to do that. But I promise you this. We pray sooner than later we'll be gathered together as a family of faith, as a church family and also will be gathered together as a community as we promised all along. And that day when we can move forward, when we can celebrate and do life as we were used to doing before, that we're gonna have a huge gathering here in the evening under the light of the Bethlehem star. Certainly there'll be hot dogs or some kind of food and lots and lots of singing and praise to God for his faithfulness to us once again. And we go forth from this place in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And may the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord make his face shine upon us and be gracious unto us. May the Lord look upon us with favor and give us his peace. Amen.
so well.